what would our world look like if we ever saw truth in politics? And do we ever currently see truth in politics? And if we do, what happens to the politician? And how does the public respond to that revelation of truth? Well, today's guest joins us from Ottawa. He is Dr. John Robson and a professor at Augustine College and a columnist with the National Post, Looney Politics, and also the Epoch Times, where he recently wrote an article entitled, Refusing to Lie or to Acquiesce in One is Vital for a Thriving Society. Good to have you with us, Dr. Robson. It's a pleasure to be here, he said truthfully. Yes, awesome. Yeah, it goes without saying, if, if someone's talking to me and they, they start a sentence with, being truthfully honest, or in all honesty, it causes me to wonder what happened to the veracity of what came before. So I want to ask you, you quote John 8.32 in your article, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. If everyone pledged never to tell a lie or to acquiesce in a lie, you suggest it would have a significant impact on our society. It would be, I think, transformative. Mm. And I want to say that it also would be transformative to the people who decide to do it. And then I want to be very clear, as I always try to be, uh, I'm not suggesting here that what we need is for everybody to be like me. This is not about how great I am. It's about how great the truth is. And when you look at it, just to begin with in politics, what is the number one thing that people hate about politicians? The thing that comes up again and again in surveys and in conversations, that politicians don't tell the truth. They say what they think will advance them personally, what will advance their party. And they're cunning at it. They put enormous amounts of time and effort into spin control, the result of which, paradoxically, is that nobody believes anything that comes out of their mouths, with rare exceptions. So it's even self-defeating tactically. But at a much more profound level, it means that government goes badly wrong and we can't have a proper discussion about what's wrong because you can't say that is the rule on almost anything that's true and important. For instance, that the Canadian healthcare system not only isn't working, but can't work as currently structured. That Canada has too much immigration. That Canadian governments spend too much and they try to do too much. Or even, and this was actually what triggered this whole thing. Okay. I got to thinking about this about a year ago because I was at a dinner that began with one of those usual uh, sanctimonious land acknowledgements. Right. And I sat there thinking to myself, this is a double lie. It is a lie because many of the people in the audience do not believe that they are on stolen land and because the people who actually do think so don't intend to give it back which in many respects is worse. And I thought, okay, here I am, the outlier weirdo, you know, don't make a fuss and annoy people. And then after the dinner was over, somebody that I knew but not very well came up to me and said, we've got to do something about those land acknowledgements. They're totally untrue. And about three or four other people from the table came over and joined in, and they all thought the same thing. And I thought, wait a minute, we all know this is a lie. And we've been sitting here cowed either by fear of the authorities or just a desire not to offend people and be you know, ostracized for the rest of the evening. When in point of fact, these land acknowledgements are even a big obstacle to reconciliation, to moving forward on the Aboriginal file, which is one of the worst messes in Canada today. And what's at the core of the whole problem? They're false. They're actually untrue. They're based on false history and they make false promises. And I thought, what if we all just said no? And that put me in mind of this thing. And now I can't find it that somebody, I'm sure somewhere said, if everybody under communism had insisted on telling the truth for one day, it would have collapsed. But so many people in so many parts of the world and in so many areas of their lives live lies and they think it makes their lives easier. But this is where you get to the personal part. It doesn't. It is a transformative experience to say from now on, I will not 
be part of falsehoods. I mean, sometimes it's awkward, right? There are moments where it would be easier to lie. You could get more money. You could escape from an awkward situation. But then you get caught in the lie and you have to keep living it. And it's not a call to be rude to people or unduly harsh in your judgments, but to be honest, never to say the thing that is not and never to sit there nodding and smiling or even just silent when you hear something you know isn't true. God, I've got to ask you this. We we do hear so many lies in politics and media. Does lying really matter? Well, I think that it does. And, and as I say, I, I think it matters in public policy mm -hmm. because it means that people are misdiagnosing a problem and then providing wrong solutions and then being deceitful about what actually happened as a result. So you don't get this kind of useful sure. feedback mechanism on what works and what doesn't. Like, whereas in the marketplace, I mean, one of the classic things, it doesn't matter what lie you tell. If there's no customer in your store, you don't make a sale. They get this inescapable truth that your product is not pleasing the public. Uh, but it's also on a personal level. And again, I brought up this example that sort of comes up in movies from time to time, but it, it's a real thing where somebody has is serving a life sentence in prison and, and justly they've been convicted of some terrible thing they did and their whole life has been a mess and you feel sorry for them, but they, they do belong behind bars. And then they find truth normally because they find the Lord and they say, for the first time in my life, I'm free. And you think to yourself, I mean, in some sense, this is an absurd statement. No, you're behind bars and there you will stay. You don't get to choose how you're going to spend your day or where, who you will associate with any of that. But the freedom that comes from setting aside the deceit and living the lie and all of the burdens, it is in fact liberating. And I found this in my own life when I changed my mind on a series of public policy issues. And every time I thought, oh, this is a bit weird, like when I became in favor of uh, civilian gun ownership, because I was believed in gun control when I was young. And I thought, this is, I'm going to go through the rest of my life carrying this idiotic belief that will crush me. And instead, it was like, hey, wait a minute. No, my worldview makes more sense. I am freer and easier. I believe in the right to self defense. Yeah. I believe that an unjust government should be opposed. It all worked for me. And then there were a series of other things, including becoming pro life right. um, and then becoming Christian. And at every step, I thought, well, now I'm really doomed to unpopularity and misery. And instead, every time the burden was lighter. So I say to politicians who are afraid if they tell a lie that their career will end? The answer is probably it won't. People will be so thrilled and excited and pleased that your popularity will soar. But suppose it does, and you have to go and do something else for a living. Okay, you're no longer a politician telling lies and implementing failed policies and pretending they worked. So you give that up. But on the other hand, you're no longer a politician implementing failed policies and deceiving people about what happened. And in your personal life, it's just cleaner. It's lighter. There are plenty of things you can do in this world where you don't have to lie, and you will be a happier and better person. So what's, what? I mean, why not try it? What is to be gained by living in a web of deceit? I mean, you look at the political parties now and their carefully massaged platforms that are just, I don't know how they can stand to recite the talking points. I don't sure. know how they can bear it. Yeah. And it's great for us to be able to have a conversation on this. It, uh, it sounds like lies is just one of the uh, uh, new set of clothing that's, that's given to the emperor for the emperor's new clothes. Uh, yes, and, and everybody does it, so it becomes habitual, and you think it's not a big deal, mm -hmm. and, oh, I'm lying today so I can be honest tomorrow. You know, the, the father of lies feeds us all kinds of sure. comforting thoughts about deceit. But at bottom, it's just a bad thing. Everybody knows deceit is bad in a marriage, deceit is bad in a family. You shouldn't deceive sure. your, your uh, kids. Your kids maybe sometimes ought to, you know, not be completely frank with you about things. But um, if it's bad in business dealings, why would it be better in politics? Why would this, where the police power of the state is invoked, why would this be the one place where it's really important to lie all the time? Well, I think that in business it would probably be referred to as fraud. Uh, a new word that we hear a lot is misinformation. Is misinformation not just a fancy word for lying? Well, it is when it's not the government saying that something that's true shouldn't be discussed because they find it unpleasant, which is where misinformation is itself very often a lie uh, because someone has said something that's actually true and people are going, oh, yeah, that's true. I didn't realize anybody else thought that. And they're like, no, no, that's misinformation. I, we went through this with COVID, right, with the masks and that sort of thing and the, 
the social distancing and the fact that the idea that this was a deadly disease to healthy middle-aged people or that uh, that if you got the vaccines, you'd never get COVID. We were just told one lie after another. But everybody who tried to say, wait a minute, I'm not sure these vaccines really work very well, or I don't think that it lurks on surfaces, or I don't think the masks are very effective, especially not the cloth ones, uh, was accused of misinformation because they were telling the truth. And that to me is ridiculous. I mean, don't don't use neologisms as a good rule for clean living as well. Right. So are there some examples that you could maybe share with us of politicians who've been good at telling the truth? Yes, and actually, the the column you referred to came out of a speech that I gave to the mm -hmm. Economic Education Association of Alberta, in which I focused on two people in particular, uh, and one of them was Martin Luther King Jr. Mm -hmm. And you think what an extraordinary moral beacon he was, and one of the reasons why is that he never lied. Well, he, in his personal life, he had some failings, but mm -hmm. in his public life, and on one point in particular, at a time, remember, when this was enormously controversial, do you want full social equality? And it would have been very easy to say, oh, no, 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 no. Uh, we're happy to be treated as second rate in all kinds of ways. We don't believe in racial marriage or intermarriage, but there's just a few little things we want. And King never said that. He said, yes, we're all God's children, and I look forward to the day when we sit down in brotherhood in the states in the United States like Georgia and Alabama, where the situation was worst at the time. And this was, it might sound tactically unwise, but in fact, even tactically, it was enormously powerful because it called people to a vision, and it did get you caught in little deceits. And then the other one that I cited, Patrick Moore, who has spoken at some of those EEA events, though he couldn't make that one. And I'm not saying that everything Greenpeace thought in the early days was correct, but here were some people who said they were always going to act on what they believed and they were always going to be straightforward about it. And they changed the world because they didn't trim and hedge and fudge like some political party. And then the third example, obviously, is Jesus Christ, and we can't be him. But at the same time, th this extraordinary power of just saying what is so and saying, I am not going to be rude about it. I'm inviting people on an exciting journey. I'm not trying to exclude them. But here's how things are. And it's enormously important that you should know it. And in the end, it will make you a better and a happier person. So come along with me. And we see how Martin Luther King changed the United States, that I have a dream speech. I think you can still find it online. And if you haven't seen that incredible concluding part of it, it is, again, almost a transformative experience. It's a marvelous thing, and everybody should watch it. Uh, and everybody should think about how we're all environmentalists now because of people like Patrick Moore. And we may still debate the details, and I hope we do so honestly. But the idea that we can afford to ignore human impact on the planet Greenpeace completely changed that, and they did it because of the power of truth and of honesty. And so it really is, again, I say to politicians, don't think I'm asking you to give up your glorious, horrible political career. Uh, I'm saying you could be a much better person and a much better politician if you just told us the truth, including when you don't know something or when you're worried about something or when you think your party's policy in some area may not be as good as the press release said it was. Talk to us like adults and you'll become an adult. Right. Well, and we want to have that give and take and conversation. It certainly takes uh, courage for politicians and other leaders to swim, let's say, upstream against the popular opinion. Uh, do you think it's possible that maybe even our education system perhaps has something to do with this peer pressure? Oh, unquestionably. I mean, one of my things I keep saying is, Everybody knows government-run schools are terrible, so why don't we bring in the voucher system under some name or another so that the government makes sure everybody can afford an education, but it doesn't actually run the schools? And surely it is so much past time to bring this in because the current result is that kids aren't learning, they're not happy, and they're not becoming good citizens. But again, I want to say to politicians, you might think that telling the truth will get you in trouble. And there, it, there will be a jolt. I'm not saying there won't. But if you make some controversial statement, here's what's going to happen. The media are going to say, wow, did you really say that? And then they're going to hand you a microphone. And you get to explain what you said and why you said it. And if you haven't thought it through, you're going to be in the soup. But if you have, it doesn't take as much courage as you might think. I mean, some sense to me, what takes enormous courage is lying, of saying, I'm going to live my whole life in a web of deceit and unhappiness. Like that, I wouldn't dare do that. 
And I'm again, I'm not saying I'm a model, right? I'm just saying the truth will make you free. And it will make you free at all kinds of levels, including you will be a lot freer from anxiety because you will no longer be living at odds with the whole way that you and the universe are meant to be. Yeah. Well, just in that conversation about freedom, it definitely makes me think of uh, me and Bobby McGee by Janis Joplin saying that uh, freedom is just another word for nothing left to lose. Uh, just from, from what we're chatting about here. Now, I wanted to ask you, um, what do you think lies have to do with the desire to control the listener? Well, yes, obviously, it, it, you're getting into what's that Martin Buber's thing about an I-it relationship with another human being rather than an I-thou relationship. Yeah. And once again, you're being promised short-term gain, but you're looking at extreme long-term loss. The idea, I mean, whoever gets to their end of their life, is it a Tony Robbins thing about you're on your deathbed? Do you think to yourself, I wish I'd manipulated people more? You know, it's like, I wish I'd spent more time playing video games, you know, or the, oh, I wish I'd spent more time drunk. Uh, there's all these sort of things that nobody ever says on their deathbed. So think about the fact that sooner or later we must all die. And what do you want on your tombstone? You know, he never told the truth unless he had to. I don't think so. I don't think, and I don't think people go into politics thinking, now I shall lie. But the process is very corrupting and subtly so. I understand it's hard. But if you take the long view and say, what do you want people, how would you like people to see you properly speaking? Those who see you as you are, because the Lord sees you as you are. What do you want him to see? Is it somebody who was so good at lying that people thought they were telling the truth? I wouldn't dare get to the pearly gates and have that be what they said. Like they, there's going to be enough bad stuff in the book already. Let's not make it worse, okay? And unfortunately, that's all the time we have today. John, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. It was great to have you here and to chat about this transformation topic. That was Dr. John Robson. He is a professor at Augustine College and a columnist with the Epoch Times.